kids ranging from, you know, 10, 12 years old to adulthood that are using this stuff. And um, obviously wow. a child's physiology is not strong enough to handle some of these chemicals. Yeah. I had to, when I lived in Detroit, yeah. which is a rundown white uh, factory town, all the jobs are gone, uh, there, there was a huge problem with heroin. And uh, there were uh, 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 some Russian Americans, a lot of Russians settled, settled in that town. There was a Russian club and whatnot. And big, beefy Ruskies. And uh, this one guy told me how his brother saved his life because he was a, he, he'd gotten on heroin. And they locked him in his bedroom. They literally locked him in there for four days straight. And uh, he went cold turkey. And, um, they, you know, he says, the nausea is unbelievable. And it, he says, and he said to me, don't believe in this rehab thing. It says, it never works. You're always going to go back to it. Ninety percent of these guys go back and they end up dead. He says, might as well just shoot me now. He yeah. says, y you've got to go cold turkey. Don't go on methadone. Uh, I, I, I tell you another case. Again, we're getting off the topic of this spice here, but I have a, I knew of a wonderful guy, real good, natural, all-American Pennsylvania guy, Air Force vet. Blue eyes, broad shoulders, played football in high school, just all American guy, you know. And uh, he was working on the front end of my car. And uh, people tell tell me their life story very quickly for some reason. And he was saying, one year ago, my son died. And um, and he, I says, oh my God. And he said, yeah, well, he was a heroin junkie, and so was his girlfriend. And they both got on methadone. I had, he says, methadone is worse than heroin. And the government makes lots of money of methadone. So and his girlfriend I stole had, and sold his on. methadone. And stole his methadone. He was so ashamed to tell the methadone clinic, my own girlfriend stole my methadone. And it was the end of the month. He said, I'll just tough it out without my methadone for three or four days. And he was like 37 years old, and he died of a heart attack from methadone withdrawal. So I, I felt like yeah, I was listening to a story from hell. I, this is such an all-American family out in the sticks of Pennsylvania. So listen to this. Now, if you think methadone is, is, is bad, okay, now, now it, we're not really off topic about the spice, because I feel like the spice is just a small piece of a, a much bigger puzzle to dirty up the youth and to dirty up the, the citizens of the United States. Um, there's another drug that is being used to um, help treat opiate withdrawal. Um, it's a drug called Suboxone. Um, this is another medication which patients are being told they have to be on this for the rest of their lives. Um, the withdrawal symptoms from Suboxone are worse than, than uh, heroin. And the only person, I mean, who stands to gain, as the Romans say, who stands to gain? The pharmaceutical companies. They stand to gain by us buying this and staying on it for the rest of our lives. And it's an extremely expensive medication. Um, a, a doctor's visit is 200 something dollars. The prescription itself is 200 something dollars. A lot of people can't afford this stuff. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, we're not really off topic. I think Spice, I think uh, Suboxone, I think all these drugs are, are just, uh, it's, a, it, it's an agenda to keep us medicated. It's, a, it's an agenda to keep us dirty. Um, I think a dirty well, I, population is an easier population to control. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you, I, just a, a little side note, a little personal note, uh, I, I have a little bit of, uh, I just turned 60, I have a little bit of glaucoma in my left eye, and uh, so I went to see a, a, an ophthalmologist, a very nice woman, and uh, she said, yeah, you gotta, you got to watch out for that, and so she gave me a, a prescription for a drug called Lumigon or something, 234 bucks a month, and and so I, and uh, it wasn't covered by my prescription uh, drug insurance, which I have. And so I, I talked to a friend, he says, just smoke some weed, man, against your glaucoma. <laughs> it won't cost you 234 bucks a month. You know, it'll have other side effects. That's what he said. It is have true. To get. But I could get, in Michigan, I mean, you get medical marijuana very easily. Yeah. It's legal in, in, yeah. you know, in Michigan. It is hard for it's one of the more progressive states. It's hard for... I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, John. I just going to say it is hard for a person, though, to, you know, to a, a, adopt the, the practice of smoking marijuana had they not done it all their lives. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, it's easy for a person who's offered a marijuana cigarette to feel guilty. Oh, jeez, like, I'm doing drugs. But it's really not all that that serious. Like, 
I really feel that marijuana is really not all that much different than, you know, having a beer. You know what I mean? As long as it's used in moderation, um, I really don't think it's, and it's, it's a helpful. It has a number of medicinal properties. Um, and that is why I believe the government is not, you know, they're giving so much crap about legalizing it. They stand to lose a lot of money. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, with the, like I said, with, uh, the, the big thing I believe is, like I said, the cancer treatments. They make a lot of money off this stuff. And uh, a lot of people just die from it. You know what I mean? They, a lot, my aunt did not survive chemotherapy. Um, really, yeah. she just suffered from it. And, and the only I comfort that she did have from the chemotherapy was marijuana. Yeah, I had a, a, a You know what I mean? Marijuana was the only comfort you had. Yeah. I had a Jewish landlord, that Ted Weiner, the late ahead, Ted Weiner. It's kind of interesting because uh, I got to really talk at great length with a, a Jewish person uh, about lots of different issues and uh, so forth. And uh, he was actually considered Judaism to be a, a business as a religion. It's just a business to get money out of Jews. And uh, he says, the Holocaust proves there's no God. It's all a crock. You know, he was a very interesting guy. He was a crusty old guy. He was a welder. Uh, I can tell you many stories about Ted Weiner. But uh, anyways, uh, he had a lot of white spots in his lungs, which he worked with a lot of asbestos. And they said, okay, you've got to have chemotherapy. You know, he died from the chemotherapy. It destroyed his heart muscle. Yep. And I remember he came up the stairs to visit me once, and he was staggering as he went up the stairs. He said to me, you know, it was kind of interesting for me to have a close relationship with this big hook-nosed Jewish guy, but I did. He was my landlord. And he was a nice guy, and uh, he knew about me and my politics, and uh, we just didn't talk about that. We talked about lots of things. Uh, he knew who I was, and um, he, he agreed that Judaism was a rip-off. It was ripping the Jews off, making victims out of the Jews. He said Judaism is uh, it, it's, it's a scam. Uh, interesting guy, but anyways, uh, I felt so pity for the guy because he was killed by the chemo. You know, I visited him many times in the hospital. Absolutely. And uh, he died from the chemo. He probably would have lived 10 more years. And it, it's, it's ironic that something that's supposed to actually help cure, uh, cure us is actually hurting us and that they're banning something and keeping something illegal that is proven that could help us. I mean, that just reeks dirty. You know, it just it doesn't add up to me. So, well, you know, weed, um, weed is uh, legal in, in certain states now, but the U.S. government is still arresting people who own dispensaries. It, it just doesn't make sense. Well, and, and, and Barack Obama, which is another reason why I loathe the man. The man loathes me. He had my Ooh. assistant arrested in 2009, spent 87 days in solitary, and was expelled back to Finland after he was broken, and then uh, the Finns dropped all three charges against him. For hate speech in return he attacked me online so Barack Obama and I have a lot of personal history it's very personal between him and me uh, FBI entering my house death threats uh, bank accounts closed uh, even the Wikipedia article on me has been deleted and Barack Obama is very involved in the hell I've been through for the last six years but Barack Obama but is Barack heavy Obama or Barry Satoro <laughs> Yeah, Barry Satoro. Well, Barry yeah, is Barack a Obama, heavy Barry, Barry Satoro. Himself. Yeah, Barry, Barry, he, it's unbelievably hypocritical of Barry Satoro to persecute marijuana users because he was actually a tumor. Uh, and for those who don't know what a tumor is, uh, yeah. on my website I talk about, about this. I mean, they, they, you, cl you, you get with your buddies in the car, you roll up all the windows, and you smoke lots and lots of pot, yeah. and you make the, your car into a gas chamber full of pot smoke. I'm heavy duty <laughs> marijuana user, Barack Obama himself. <laughs> I think he actually thanked his pot dealer in his yearbook. I'm pretty sure he thanked his pot dealer in his yearbook. There was something to that effect. <laughs> He's such a but, uh, hypocrite. Yeah, I mean, yeah Barry's, fact, uh, Barry's, a, Barry's definitely a, a weed smoker. I, I Actually, I, I showed a picture. If you look up Barack Obama stone on Google Images, see quite a few pictures of him. And there's one in particular, I showed it to a friend of mine who's a rock musician. I says, do you think Barack, it was a press conference. He held a press conference and uh, he really looked stoned in the press conference. And so I, I, I wrote my friend, and I says, what do you think of his picture? He says, I'm telling you as a rock musician, he was stoned. <laughs> I mean, he's in the White House. Uh, it, it, would take, it would take somebody. 
Yeah, it would take him. I mean, I guess he would have the experience to know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but he's such but, a hypocrite. Um, you know, um, and to... Yeah, I, I mean, my fiance, my fiance is holding up her cell phone right now and showing me a picture of of, uh, of Barry Satoro smoking a marijuana cigarette, wearing a kind of a, like a, a corn hat. You know, it's pretty funny actually. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, she's over here pulling up pictures right now of uh, of <laughs> Barack, tuming as it yeah. were. Yeah, tuming. Oh, there's lots of pictures. But um, yes, you know. Well, the, As, as I was saying, again, I, I mean, Obama, I mean, being a marijuana smoker himself in the past, you think that he would, you know, be a little bit more lenient on, on the marijuana laws. You well, know? people but, thought um, he was going to be cool. Just, he was going to be a cool president. He was going to be totally unlike Bush. We wouldn't be involved with wars in the Middle East. He'd close Guantanamo. He'd stop the torture program. Uh, he'd, uh, being a Democrat, he'd be a friend of the little guy. And, uh, you know, uh, like Harry Truman was, and, and, and in other words, uh, Harry Truman once said, if you want to live like the Republicans, you got to vote for the Democrats. In other words, let's lift working class people up and create a strong middle class. But the, the rich are still getting richer under Obama. The poor are getting much poorer. I, I could say, getting a little bit off topic here, but uh, 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 dangerous drugs, uh, here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I was sort of lured up here by a friend who offered two months free rent. He says the people are great and it's beautiful up here. And that was all true. What he didn't tell me is there are no jobs and the utility bills are double or triple what they are in other parts of the country. Uh, and because there are no jobs, you either join the military to go off to kill the enemies of the Jews in the Middle East and get your arms and legs blown off, uh, or you get involved with selling heroin or bath salts or, or, you know, something else like that. I mean, we have constant drug raids here in this small town by the state police. It's kids selling bath salts. There's no jobs. We had a, a yeah. flourishing paper mill. What? They closed that down. And we're importing paper now from China. This is an ocean of trees. They closed down two huge paper mills in the area, which where people were making great money, supporting the local restaurants, buying Chevys, buying Fords, Car dealerships are closed. The restaurants are closed. Even the bars have closed. Uh, they closed down the shipbuilding, the shipyard. They closed down the copper mining. And they're importing copper from, from Chile now. And so uh, people allow have me, no money. Allow me to uh, interrupt you here a moment to sure, point out sorry. that our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and, of course, our flag, we're all made from hemp. And uh, if we grew hemp and allowed our farmers to grow hemp, we could make yeah. all of the paper out of hemp paper. Yeah, Just another yeah, resource. And that I, hemp I, was I, I the number... The hemp was the number one cash crop in America in the 30s, according yeah, to the popular mechanics. All right, go ahead, here. Go ahead. Quit talking over me or I'll hang up on you. Now, go ahead. Now, now you can speak. Uh, go ahead. My apologies. I'm having a little bit of tr trouble with my phone. All right, okay. go ahead. Yeah. We can hear you now, Steve. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, I, as I was saying, uh, I apologize, I don't have a little echo of my phone. Um, uh, the term legal tender for all that's public and private, I believe, actually refers to, um, that's on our money, because I believe we were able to um, uh, pay our taxes with hemp uh, back in those days. And I, I'm pretty sure that that's where the term legal tender on money comes from. Um, so, I mean, our country has a long history of, you know, of, of, you know, of dealing with hemp. I mean, it's really not a bad substance it helps a lot of people but back to the, the spice thing you know why are we you know pushing back hemp and why is this stuff so readily available you know there's, there's children literally robbing their families robbing their their uh, you know their, their parents their mother's purses um, there, I, I heard a story about a kid actually was on the news who actually stole he went into a uh, curry donuts and stole the tip jar and the cancer funds oh. charity. Oh. 
stole that so that they can buy spice. <laughs> um, oh these are the lengths that people are going to to get this drug. Yeah, I, it's pretty damn low. Um, so when, when you see oh. stuff like that happening, that's red flags for me. You know, there's there's bad things happening. Our kids don't need to be smoking this stuff. Um, I think definitely there has to be more legislation. People have to look at this stuff. Um, it's just not it's not out there like it should be. They're not talking about it. It's killing people. It's harming kids, and just nobody's hearing about it. Um, it's supposed to be legal, but it's readily available. It's, it's just it's, it's a sickening thing. Um, I don't know if I can do other than speak about it. Yeah, Steve, I've, uh, I've, I've gotten reports now from both Australia. They say it's banned in Australia, and uh, it's banned in Germany but it's flourishing and legal in the United States. In other words, if it, if it harms and kills young people, it's legal. If it's good for you, it's illegal. Absolutely. I mean, America is insane. Uh, it's not just that. Uh, by the yeah, way, you know, we have bovine growth hormone in our milk and in our beef. It's completely illegal in all the European Union, and it's, uh, it's, it's banned there, and it's legal in the United States. All these things are, you know, well, I mean, if it kills you, it's legal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in 2010, Spice sent 11,000 people to the hospital. Um, we sent zero to the hospital. So, I mean, those are the statistics you're looking at. Terrible, terrible job. And you know, I was... Uh, it uh, yeah, it gets... Go ahead. You know, uh, Clay, I was... Uh, I, uh, I normally don't listen to Alex Jones too much because I hate it. He does all this Nazi bashing and down with the Germans. He says some ridiculous stuff. So he stays on the air. And, uh, he was, but he had on David Icke the other day, uh, and it was very interesting. Uh, I did a blog about that because uh, I could, both of them pulled their punches on the Jewish question. But uh, he was – David Icke really was interviewed and very well spoken, and he talked about this whole concept that there's a demonic intelligence – which is gradually engulfing and taking over the Western world. And he said, they, there's a frequency of suffering that they feed off. And so when young people are suffering, when families are suffering, when people are going through withdrawal, or you know, as Steve is saying, stealing the tip jar from the employees at a donut shop, or stealing the donations for a cancer fund, you know, I mean, it just, there's so much suffering going on, or veterans committing suicide. Uh, that there is an evil, and he says, you can call it the devil, you can call it demons. In the Arabic language, they call it jinn, our word genie is related to that. Um, in the Zulu language in Africa, they call it chituri or something. He says, all religions talk about there is truly a malevolent intelligence that feeds off suffering. Yep. And when I see people suffering from cancer, suffering from drugs, suffering from poverty, uh, divorce, domestic violence, everything caused by the spillover effects of these drugs, uh, America is just one big quivering mass of suffering right now. And he says it's demonic. There is a demonic force. And all the great religions of the world, they call it the devil or whatever they call it, there is a malevolent intelligence the world is becoming a black and evil place, and the more people quiver in agony, the more this entity feeds off it. And, and, and Alex Jones said, I know a lot of people think David Icke's crazy. He talks about reptiles and, and things like that. And I says, but listen, here's the guy out. He with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, but I, some of his stuff I think is true, and I think he has been ridiculed. He says, I'm dismissed, I'm condemned, uh, I'm ignored. Uh, and he says, but I, 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 I truly believe in the existence of a devil. I believe the devil is a real being. I didn't used to. I didn't used to. I believe that. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no. I believe Zachariah Sitchin actually told uh, Ike not to talk about some of this stuff. Kind of threatened him not to talk about some of this stuff. I, I was reading somewhere. I was reading somewhere that Sitchin is actually disinformation agent for the for the government. So. I mean, that rabbit hole goes a lot deeper when you talk about that stuff. There's, you know, aliens and all of that. Um, I do believe what you say about the, uh, you know, there's a tangible evil that is, that is uh, you know, that is growing and, and fed off the suffering of people. I totally believe that. Um, 
exactly what it is. Is it the devil? Is it something? I'm not sure. I do know that our government is definitely feeding into this. Um, I don't trust our government. I don't think anybody does at this point. And, uh, you know, just, and it's another point, like, just feeding our kids this stuff, the spice, the, the flocka, the, the face chewing, uh, <laughs> the face chewing bats off drugs, um, you know, the black smoke portals appear, appearing in the sky, the, the water turning red. I mean, it really does point to something much bigger, um, much bigger than us. Um, do I have the comprehension to understand all these things? I don't think I do. I think, we all just kind of have to sit back and wait and see what happens. Mm. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ike is saying, uh, because clearly they're targeting children, and what uh, Ike said, he, he refers yeah. to them as the archons, which is a term from Gnosis. I mean, this is not David Ike. This is 2,000 years old, uh, a religion called Gnosis, uh, and uh, which means knowledge. And uh, that's the term. That's their term, archons. He says that they feed off the energy of children before puberty. There's something very pure about their energy and their essence. And so, uh, you know, it's this the pedophilia, human sacrifice of children, uh, bleeding them out dry, slitting their wrists, and then torturing them as they bleed to death, and it's just like mind-boggling stuff. Uh, but the point is, is that the suffering of a child for these, he calls them energetic vampires, is, is that's, that's like a, a steak, a sirloin steak dinner for these evil entities is the suffering of a child. I and mean, you look at the young people, how they're targeting young people for these drugs. Um, he also said, you know, well, uh, well, okay, what's the... easier to manipulate. Yeah. Because they're gullible. Uh, I, I was just saying, kids are no easier to manipulate than adults. Yes. Absolutely. They, they don't they have, have their control. own minds just yet. They're looking for us and they're looking to the world to, you know, for knowledge. They're looking to the world around them to learn. So, I mean, if the world around us is crap, if the world around us is evil, what is that? It's crumbling. You know, what does that say for our kids who are learning? You know, that's their, their only way of, of, you know, advancing is to look at the world around them, the people around them. That's how we learn. And if, I mean, if everything's going to crap, I, I can't even imagine what the future's going to hold for, you know, my kids, kids, you know, my great-grandkids. It, it's a scary thing. Yeah, it's very scary. Yeah, if we ask um, guys today, who knows what kind of, yeah, who knows what kind of drugs are going to be out there tomorrow. Maybe there's something, I mean, it's already killing you with one hit. <laughs> so, who knows? You think it was just a coincidence? That 17 little children were sacrificed at Waco. That 22 little children were sacrificed at Oklahoma City. And, of course, uh, we've got uh, the ones that may or may not have been sacrificed at the uh, I, I Sandy Hook. Yeah, uh, it, it's clear that they're targeting uh, children. And that, you think about yeah, all I your legends the about the uh, about the vampires, about the succubus. The, uh, I mean, these people they feed off of your fear, and this is what uh, one of the things that Alex Jones does. He wants you to be afraid. If you're afraid of these people. It strengthens them and empowers them. And I think this is one of the reasons they hate me so much, because I'm not afraid of them, and they can sense that. I, they can walk into a room with me and know that I know who they are and know that I'm not afraid of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the concern... I think any of us are afraid of them. <laughs> What's that? You know, it, it's just a matter of how to deal with it. No, I don't think any any of us are actually afraid of this. I, I just think any as scary as it is, I think we just are trying to struggle to find ways to deal with it. Um, you know, because it, it really, I mean, how do you deal with people that are so powerful? 
You know what I mean? They, well, they're, the, they're the problem that we have, I've told people over and over and over again, the problem we have is how do you fight evil without becoming evil? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I've, uh, I did a video a uh, lot long ago on the topic of VIP pedophiles, and I'm very proud to say that uh, on this distasteful topic, it's gotten 25,000 views, and I talk about this Jeffrey Epstein case. That's a video, by the way. Thank you. It's, uh, and it's now out in German subtitles, and um, it, it's, it's, I think it's a fascinating case um, because it involves a convicted pedophile named Jeffrey Epstein, billionaire, and he would fly on his private Boeing 727, uh, the, the just top, top Americans, down to this private orgy island in the Caribbean, uh, such as President Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton. Uh, ironically enough, uh, another person was a Ken Starr, who investigated Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky thing, spent $70 million to find out if he had a blowjob or not. Um, and uh, you had, I bring up uh, Charlie Gibson, who for 30 years was the host of Good Morning America and then ABC Nightly News until 2009, uh, the black comedian Chris Tucker, um, several mem- Oscar winner Kevin Spacey, uh, several members of the Bush family, all on the flight books of this private Boeing flying down. Now, this, was, this is not some top secret news. I got it by going to the checkout counter at the local supermarket, and there it was in the National Enquirer two weeks in a row. So what's happening here? People say, well, what, what's going on with this? Uh, why didn't the New York Times report about it, or the Washington Post, or ABC, or CBS, or NBC? Um, Fox barely covered it because they wanted to bash Clinton, because they wanted to bash Hillary Clinton, you know, and say her husband's potentially a pedophile. So the point is, this is how they fire the people who control our country, fire a warning shot across the bow of these VIPs. It says, we're leaving it just in the tabloids now, like National Enquirer. But we could at any moment decide to put this as the lead item on ABC Nightly News or the CBS Evening News with that, what's his name, Perry or something, or or any of these others. It could be front page in the Washington Post tomorrow. So, uh, Hillary, just to remember, we could take your husband down as a pedophile at any moment if you don't do... When we give you your orders, you better carry them out. And, oh, Alan Dershowitz, one of the number one Jewish activists in America, uh, lawyer for decades now at uh, a law professor at Harvard Law School, uh, all these uh, on the flight books flying to the private orgy island where 10-year-old children were molested. And uh, oh, Prince Andrew of England. How could I forget Prince right. Andrew of England? Uh, so, so basically they're attacking children. Uh, because there's something about uh, the suffering of a child that these, they call them energetic vampires, are feeding off. And what Ike goes into, uh, his claim is, is that these elites, have, you know, and you have to notice, they're trying to spoon feed us now. The next two candidates for president will be another Clinton and another Bush, Jeb Bush. I mean, we've got frigging dynasties now. You know, it's going to be a Kennedy or it's going to be a Roosevelt. It's going to be a Bush. It's going to be a Clinton. We have these royal dynasties now keep popping up, and we have no choice or skull and bones. In 1980, 2004, both candidates for president, John Kerry and George Bush, were both Yale graduates and both skull and bones. So your choice is choose your poison, basically. (laughs) Crazy, crazy. Yeah, um, I just don't vote. Yeah, a lot of people don't vote anymore. It's the same as true in Germany and in England. Uh, a lot of people don't vote. And actually, they're threatening in, uh, I think, in one of these European countries, it'll be a, a crime to not vote. They want to force you to vote. Go through the charade. Uh, it'll be a crime Even not to vote. Even the candidate just, who's not a criminal, and maybe will vote. Yeah, yeah. I was very disappointed in Ron... Uh, Paul, because uh, uh, he, 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 I believe he probably won the New Hampshire primary in 2008, probably also in 2012. And he let them steal it through electronic vote fraud 
I was a victim myself of electronic vote fraud in 1990 when I ran for U.S. Congress, the Republican primary, in the 6th Congressional District of Tennessee, near Nashville. It was blatant electronic vote fraud. So through a friend, I contacted Ron Paul and said, what you should do is say, everybody who voted for me, uh, go to a notary and sign a statement, a notarized statement, I voted for Ron Paul today, and send me a photocopy of your notarized statement. He says, in that way, they won't be able to steal his primary How victory. How do you characterize your relationship? When it uh, and uh, Ron Paul actually got on the radio and said, maybe that's what I'll do. He actually took my suggestion, didn't use my name, and says, I will maybe ask all my supporters to sign a notarized statement. I voted today for Ron Paul. And it says, that way we can prove if they steal my victory that I won by all these people with thousands of notarized statements. But, you know, he didn't do it. And so they stole his election victory in New Hampshire in uh, January 2008, and that def deflated all his supporters. There was this Ron Paul media, and Ron Paul's the stand up for the con Constitution. Ron Paul's pro gun. He's from Texas. He's a good guy. Actually, he's from Pennsylvania. We'll get heated. But, uh, and uh, Ron Paul is not a lawyer. I mean, most of your politicians are lawyers working for the yeah. Bar Association, the uh, British Accredited Registry. They are foreign agents, the same way as uh, these dual citizens that support Israel. Yeah, he's a baby doctor, actually, uh, Air Force doctor in the Air Force, and uh, I guess he was he finished his Air Force career down in Texas and just stayed there, loved Texas, and uh, congressman for many years. He seemed like a kindly old grandpa. It was hard to paint him as a villain or a Nazi or a hater or a bigot. So many people, including a close friend of mine, really went out to Iowa to help him win the Iowa caucuses. And they, they stole his victory there. And then he didn't protest. Then they stole his victory in New Hampshire. He didn't protest. And so that let all the air out of the tires of all his supporters. Because they really thought Ron Paul was going to win the New Hampshire primary. And uh, he didn't protest when they raped, it, raped him and stole it. So people decided he was the worst. And, and he... He was up there in those Republican debates, and uh, they said, uh, somebody said, oh, well, what do you think about 9-11? And he says, well, I support the government's conclusions. And a friend of mine down in Georgia said there was this collective groan that went across the living room when he said that. <laughs> he, like, he accepts the government's conclusions about 9-11. So people said, he sold out, that's it. <laughs> They've gotten to him. You know, it's very sad. He's probably the last chance America had. Well, he, he has the odds stacked against him. They just threatened to kill you or kill your wife or kill your kids or indict you for something. And, you know, if, if you're not willing to die, I mean, look, the thing is, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, Ben Frankel, all of these guys who were willing to die, they put their life on the line. If you're not willing to die and go all the way, and that's one reason why I enjoy being on, on Clay's show. You know, Clay's an old biker, and he's in a lot of conflicts with the government. You've got to be willing to die without fear, to lay your life down on the altar of freedom. And if you're not, uh, they'll sense your fear, and they'll have some little off-the-records meeting with you, maybe in a diner somewhere. They'll knock at your hotel room at night and say, look. Mr. Congressman Paul, this is what we're going to do to you and your family. We're going to destroy you. And that's what they did to Jim Traficant. I have a very close friend who was very close friends with Jim Traficant. He was very anti-Israel. Two weeks after Traficant appeared on my show, he had a tractor accident and died. Yeah. That was pretty uh, strange, yeah. I thought. Yeah, my, my friend uh, uh, Pete Papa Heraklis, who, who's a, I always call him Pete the Greek, he's from Greece originally, but he came here as a teenage boy. Um, he writes a lot for American Free Press and the Barnes Review magazine. And uh, he thinks that, uh, he's not sure whether it was a hit. Uh, certainly, you know, the tractor did flip over on him uh, on flat ground. But uh, he actually says that uh, Jim told him 
uh, a few weeks before that he felt that he was dying. He was having heart problems, uh, distress, and who knows, maybe they poisoned him in the five years he was in the federal prison. Uh, but he felt his health was going down. It's possible he did just have a heart attack while he was riding his tractor. I don't know. Uh, Pete was very concerned about the reaction of the wife, though. It was like some of the, the wife and kids were, like, happy that he was dead and happy that their husband or father was gone because he was an embarrassment to them, and they were afraid of the Jews, and they were glad it was all over, you know, and Pete was disgusted about that. Um, if, if I may interject, if I may interject, I've noticed a lot of people have been dropping like flies for, um, for looking into alternative, uh, alternative energy as well. Um, I, I know a Dr. Eugene Malove, who um, had some theories on cold fusion, ended up dead. Um, there's another guy named Meyer who claimed that he could, uh, he could uh, get an engine to run on water, that, uh, that he could separate the hydrogen and, and get cars to run on water. Um, he ended up dead. I, I believe he was, uh, he was sitting at uh, a table in a restaurant with his brother um, discussing whether or not they're going to do this and, uh, you know, let this out uh, or sell it to the government or whatever they wanted to do. He wanted the people to have this. And um, I guess they were telling him, no, you know, this is, you know, we want to keep this secret. We don't want everybody to know that cars can run on water. So he's at, he's sitting at the table talking to his brother. He takes a sip of cranberry juice, grabs his throat, says they poisoned me, right? and he's dead oh now. Oh, God. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, the government has a history of offing people who, you know, who are on to things that may actually help the populace. Um, so... I mean, how could we not benefit from automobiles who that run on water? You know what I mean? Um, how the government obviously would lose a lot of money. We have no, really, no need for oil or fossil fuels. So you know, obviously they had to take out Mayor. Um, they had to take out Malove because of uh, you know his theories on coal fusion. So I mean, there's a long line of this stuff happening. So <laughs> I guess if you're a scientist and you have uh, you know any kind of radical technology that would help. <laughs> the world you have to be careful and you have to look over your shoulder because you know there could be a guy in the bushes with a blow dart just ready to kill you well i think that they're very That's concerned no and it affects their money yeah i mean here in ontonagon michigan yeah i live right in the town right on lake superior and our water bill is 80 bucks a month i was paying like 25 a month in pennsylvania get a lot of rain in pennsylvania as you know, Steve, um, and everything is green and lush. And so it's appropriate to have a water bill of not more than 20 or 25. There's water, there's lakes everywhere, there's rivers everywhere. Uh, but I'm paying 80 bucks a month for water, and I'm living on the greatest, the largest lake in the world. Uh, I'm paying 185 a month in car insurance. I was paying 49 in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm paying like 180 a month in electricity. Uh, I'm paying uh, like just staggering amounts for gas heat. It's keeping the white people up here poor. You can't take your lady to a restaurant because you've got to pay a water bill instead. You can't fix your car. I mean, I've ended up walking. Yeah, really. I actually have to live with a room. I'm living with a roommate right now because we literally can't afford to pay uh, for the utilities on you know the money that we're making. Well, I actually have to go in with a roommate, you know, to, to survive. Uh, so I mean, it's, it is it is not much better here in Pennsylvania. Um, maybe it should be, but you know, the powers that be do not allow that to happen. Mm. Well, well, what you know, uh, Clay, I'm, I they're talking a lot about this TTIP free trade thing that Obama's trying to get with the Asians. And uh, one of the things I've heard about it is that it will, one of the big components of it is privatization. The water supply, electricity, phone, everything will be privatized. Um, I, I know because I have a lot of supporters in Germany and I blog in German that they privatized the electrical system in Germany and the electrical rates tripled. Tripled. Uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, the elect uh, utility bills are skyrocketing. How are utility bills in Texas, uh, Clay? Well, they're high, and the same thing is happening with the water bills. 
Really? The uh, the water bills are like a hundred bucks a month, something like that. Oh my God! Now you've had a terrible drought. Although I heard that it recently you've you've gotten rain in Texas, but there's been a terrible drought in California and in other areas. But you've had a terrible drought in Texas too, haven't you? Yes, we have. And, and you just got some rain recently, though, right? Yeah, we've got some rain recently. California is in a thousand-year drought, so it's a uh, you know whether this is man-made, uh, we really have no way of telling here. Well, the thing is, it's keeping people poor. And I think when people are poor, uh, you know, they tend to drink too much or they'll, they, they'll use drugs. If you make marijuana illegal, then you're a criminal uh, for using it. And they're making people so miserable, they have to turn to some kind of drug or something because they're miserable all the time. And that, that's what I see. That's why I, I actually, for the first time, I really listen to David Icke carefully. This is there's a malevolent consciousness which feeds off misery. And, uh, and, and in particular, they're targeting uh, children. I mean, I can't think of anything more despicable than the molestation of children or to hook children on drugs and ruin their lives. I mean, and, and, and you know, they're, they're, just, they're just a hulk. They're just a, a shell of a human being. They live to get their drugs. They're junkies. They end up going to prison. Uh, they have no future. Uh, and uh, I see abuse domestic violence, and, uh, you know, I, I was on Clay's show a couple of weeks ago and I talked about we need a new religion because people, are, their souls are dying. They're just becoming zombies, miserable zombies, trudging to work if they have a job or sitting in front of their Internet if they can afford the Internet. Otherwise, they're going to the library. They can't even afford a computer at home now. A dirty, distracted population is an easier population to control. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's, uh, I think everybody knows that. And you break their pride. You humiliate them. You break their pride. I think it's one of the key reasons why rape is so important, because you want to humiliate profoundly. I, I was blessed as a kid. And the whole point of that is to break, the, especially in a boy, to break his pride, his manly pride. Uh, and, and in girls also. It's just like breaking a horse or something. Or, you know, I've, I've been experienced that in Marine Corps boot camp. Uh, for three months, they just tell you who's boss. They make you understand it's this tremendous amount of fear. And in the end, you will instantly do as you're told uh, because it's been a three month long assault on your nervous system. And believe me, people are eliminated from the program. You come back from lunch at the mess hall and you know guys gone that <laughs> you were with for 60 days straight it's a type of program no, no, it's, it's program yeah i mean the marine corps I'm, I'm and then we gather it as a group now you sent me something i think it might uh, be time to take a look at this this comes from a jewish rabbi and uh, he's talking about the Israeli nation. Can we uh, listen to this for just a second here? Sure. Because I think it's irrelevant. There are, and we've talked about this on my show before, about books of the Bible that were kept from us that were removed. They weren't put into the Bible. And in that, that book, the they, the they, what's that? Uh, there is a, a book, The Lost Books of the Bible, and I believe the Book of Enoch, or some the of the book, things that, the book that, of Enoch. Some of the books that were omitted. Yes, it was the Book of Enoch, and they referred to Archons, archons that uh, had come to this planet. Now, this from an uh, Israeli rabbi. They encounter all sorts of problems. Some fall down, some are more successful, some discover 
the mission better on the way. Say they're sent to a different world altogether, a different planet where the conditions are unknown, nothing is known, and on the way they have to get along by themselves, manage the process, understand what actions to take, how to achieve the final goal, conquer that new place that they don't know its nature and conditions beforehand. So that group goes through various problems, as if they go through jungles and swamps and deserts and all sorts of, of uh, scrutinies within the nation. They fight among themselves as well. They have those little feuds and separations and connections, and it all happens within that commando that was sent to conquer a land. And that's sort of how I look at describing this battle which we are in. This is the Rav, the uh, Rabbi Michael Leitman, L-A-I-T-M-A-N, and he's talking about the Jews being sent here from another dimension, another planet, another universe to conquer this planet. Yeah, I'm going to bring you that up, Clay. I appreciate actually about that. I'm sorry, what now? Um, John actually has an interesting video of a rabbi speaking about this stuff, how they're actually interdimensional beings from, am, uh, from another planet. I'm and, trying uh, to play that right now, sir. I am trying to play that video right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So there's a certain calculation and a certain approach to our friends who fell on the way, those pulling us forward, those uh, showing the path on which we advance. There's many steps in this process. It's really like a very unique historical adventure of those reincarnating souls that follow their instructions cycle after cycle until they come to the last phase where they already came to the right place and now they need to set themselves up they need to arrange themselves or align themselves towards the last battle that's all good if the battle would continue in a way that uh, we know from adventures or discovery of new lands where you go through a big ocean jungles you encounter some tribes that you fight with you conquer you connect with and so on but there's a different battle here and that one is an inner battle not an external one where using the force of the ego and egoistic bonding and and trying to chase some external enemy where where all our envy lust and our honor and power all our evil natural inclinations that are at work and then we just need big muscles to succeed 
here we're talking about a complete opposite internal process where we all have to succeed in the inner um, war. We think that we always have to exploit the external enemy, sorry, to win over, to triumph the external enemy. In truth, it's only an imagination. If we win over ourselves, then the external enemy disappears. If not, we have to fight the external enemy as well in the meantime in order to buy us some time because we are entering the, the time zone now. If we're not working against the inner enemy, then that's where we have to meddle with time. So we have to do an external action to buy us time for spiritual action. That's why we're in a world that is completely divided into two. Part of it is corporeal, part of it is spiritual. And this is how we have to relate to our friends. Those who are with us in corporeal systems and those who are with us in spiritual systems. Both have a good and beautiful part in this great battle towards the final correction. Now, I... Uh this is a little vague to me, John. You may have listened to this more than uh, than I have. He is being very vague here, and I have heard uh, parts of this where he's talking about this uh, battle, uh, as he calls it. What uh, can you uh, outline a little bit more of this so I don't have to? We don't have to uh, drag yeah, along yeah. here while he's trying to. Uh... Yeah. Well, uh, the yeah the section that you played there is basically some uh, sounds like an American teenage Jewish boy, and he is translating into English from Hebrew. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rabbi Michael Lightman, as you pointed out, who has a very fancy website. He's met with Eli Weasel. It's pretty his website that he met with Eli Weasel, the Nobel Prize winning guy who moans about the Holocaust all the time. Uh, this is a top rabbi with the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. And uh, what he is saying is exactly as you pointed out. And this is, it's called, the, the YouTube video is called Israeli Nation parenthesis lesson close parenthesis with rav which is a word for ra rabbi among the kabbalah jews is called a rav r-a-v with rav michael lightman l-a-i-t-m-a-n it's right on youtube israeli nation lesson with rav michael lightman and uh what he is saying uh is that is exactly as you pointed out uh he is saying that we are from uh, another planet we come from an alien race. We were set here to conquer the earth. So in the, sec in the section that you played, he's talking about uh, the battle. And, and, and there's two, like, two sides of the universe. And, you know, we are destined. He's basically saying we're destined to control the earth. Now, some of the more juicy quotes, which I, I listen to some of this stuff. And this is a major, major joke. He goes, flies back and forth between Israel, where he speaks and lectures in Hebrew. And this video, he's lecturing to a room full of Israelis in Hebrew. Uh, it's like 200 young students. This is a major guy, and he's talking in Hebrew. And other videos on YouTube, Michael Lightman is talking in Russian, and he's in St. Petersburg. But he's flying back and forth between the Russian community and, and, and the Jewish community in Russia 
and his flock down there in Israel. And he's got a big website, very fancy website. He graduated from some Russian Academy of Sciences, and he meets with Nobel Prize winners. Um, at 16, at the, at the 16th minute and the 42nd second, he says, having that energy from that planet, meaning the home planet of the Jews, we will take over those living on this earth. At 2042, he refers to the people of earth. And he says, and the Jews must conquer and lead them. At 2139, uh, Clay, he says, maybe we will throw something into their water. And their meaning the earthlings' water. Maybe we'll put something into their water. Uh, at 23.05, he says, uh, he, he basically refers to the Jews as being programmed by some sort of cosmic software, and he says, the hard drive with the data is being revealed in you, like the Jews are part of some software program taking over the earth. It's bizarre, but I'm just quoting from the guy. It's all on my, yeah. my website, johndugy.us. At 25.28, he says, the Jews at one time were almost dissolved into the, quote, earthlings, like they were intermarrying with earthlings, and then somebody put a stop to intermarriage between Jews, and he's using the word earthlings. <laughs> at 25.34 uh, through 48, he says, Jews aren't from this world. They are from another planet. I agree with that. If you go back and read the Old Testament, it would seem that, that what they are saying agrees with this Rabbi Lightman, that uh, the, the Jewish God of the Old Testament does not seem to be the God of Jesus to me but more of a conqueror, more of an yep. evil God. And uh, we've talked about that, the whole God, uh, Yahweh, being an evil God, uh, actually a satanic God. And I've told people that if you consider yourself to be a... Uh, Jewish uh, or a uh, a Jewish a Christian, you might as well be saying you're a satanic Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, huh. yeah. I mean, as I put out my blog, I, which I, I did, if people want to look up at JohnDewish.us, it was on May 14th. It's the title of it is Kabbalistic Top Rabbi says Jews come from an alien race to conquer the world. I, I, I run that famous quote from Jesus in John uh, chapter 8, verse 44, where he says to the Jewish leaders, you're from your father, the devil. And says the devil was a liar and murderer from the beginning. And he speaks a lie. He speaks out of his own nature because that's all he is, is lies and murder. Uh, and so I mean, Jesus is really at that point declaring war on Judaism. I mean, you can't more massively reject somebody to say, you're you're possessed by Satan. <laughs> That's at crossing the line there. And actually, uh, if you actually read there at the end of John, John chapter eight, the Jews then chased after Jesus to kill him, but he ran out of the temple. So I mean, that was truly Jesus crossed the line with the Jews. From that point on, it was war between Jesus and the Jewish leadership. Uh, but he had a huge following with the people and, and the Jewish. There's quotes there where the Jews are saying, we can't just seize Jesus because the people love him. So we've got to indict him, we've got to or arrest him at night when the supporters aren't there. Uh, you know, we have to be very careful how we do this. We've got to take him down. We've got to accuse him of some crime like blasphemy, or we'll tell oh, we'll tell the Romans he's trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. He's trying to make himself the king of the Jews and, and expel the Romans from Palestine. So they, they were very careful. Jesus was charismatic. He was beloved. He was healing the sick. And Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, you're from the devil. You serve Satan. So, <laughs> I mean, so it's, it's scary. I mean, this is what the Gospel of John says. And in fact, 
if the Bible is ever banned, the first thing they will do, and I, I, I can take this from reading what Abraham Foxman of the ADL has said. He said, the most anti-Semitic book in the New Testament is the Gospel of John. That's the first thing that has to go. Gospel of John. And uh, you've got Jesus warning you 2,000 years ago to beware those who call themselves Jews but are not are of the synagogue of Satan. Right, right. And when he says Jew, I mean, the, the way uh, I've read a great deal about this, uh, the Jews were, were trying to actually convert people or at least make lots of friends in the Roman power structure including the mistress of Nero, the one who started burning the Christians alive and feeding them to the lions after Rome was burned down. Pope, his, his mistress, who was very pro-Jewish, listened to the rabbis and said, well, blame it on the Christians. Say the gods are angry at Rome for tolerating Christianity, and the Christians are against the Roman religion, and they're against the Roman Empire. And so um, there was tremendous anger at Nero for the fact that half the city of Rome burned to the ground. And his incompetence and the failure to save the capital of the Roman Empire. So blamed on the Christians. And at that was the point when Christianity was banned. Uh, but th what the Jews said was, we worship the one true God, this benevolent, wise creator of the universe. And all the gods of the other peoples are demons. Well, what David Icke says in an interview with Alex Jones is, everything is about inversion. It's the exact opposite of the truth the exact opposite of everything. Everything must be inverted to being the opposite. So if the Jews worship Satan, then you say, no, 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 we worship the only true God. You worship Satan. Or uh, I remember I was in a, a, a tavern once in the Trona Heights near the steel mill there. And some guy said to me, he said to me, yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, Hitler and, and Goering, they were diddling little boys. I looked at the guy, I just want to take out a shotgun and blow his effing head off. He says, where did you get that? He says, the Jews that you worship and whose lies you believe, they're the ones molesting children. He says, Hitler ex executed pedophiles. And he crushed the gay pride. He, was not, he wasn't like killing or arresting homosexuals. He was against the militant gay pride movement. Uh, and and it, 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 actually the SS did a tremendous amount of research on this whole question of pedophilia, uh, which is a whole other topic. But everything is the inverse. Like, the Jews are trying to take over the world, so, the, so of course, they accuse Hitler of trying to take over the world. The Jews act like a conquering master race, so, of course, they accuse the Germans of trying to conquer the world. Uh, the Jews call... Clay Douglas and Steve and me, they call us terrorists and extremists when they're the ones overthrowing the U.S. government and our Constitution. It's, just, it's, it's a systematic policy, the inversion of everything, being the exact opposite of the truth. And then the gullible person says, oh, my God, I mean, I can't believe what you're telling me. He says, yeah, we've been, America's been taken over by a satanic force. 75% of America has been taken over at this point, and uh, it, it, we need a new faith in God and ourselves to reverse this course, because otherwise, uh, I believe what will happen within the next few years, you're going to start having mass suicides. Just before Hitler came to power in the year 1932, uh, there was about 400,000 Germans committed suicide. They had no money. They had no hope. The Communist Party was rising to power. Uh, and the Soviet Union was right next door to Germany, too. And uh, people, women, were jumping uh, into the river with their children, holding their children. Uh, veterans were killing themselves. Uh, people had no more food. People had no more money. They, they couldn't get any more money from their relatives. And so they were killing themselves. There was a wave of suicides. And I think that's what's going to happen, is that you're going to start having huge numbers of suicides in America, and people will hit uh, the wall. They'll reach the pit of absolute misery. Because I could say, because, you know, I've had experience with suicidal thoughts because I was molested as a kid. And, uh, and 
it, it's, it's, you have to be really miserable to think of ending your own life because it's a powerful animal instinct to fight for survival. And to actually kill yourself, it so much goes against the grain of your DNA and your every healthy instinct to kill yourself. You have to be really miserable. And I think that Americans are going to get to that point of the black pit of absolute despair. And at that point, if we are there with a new message, a fresh new message, then they will turn to us as the German people turn to Hitler. And he did save them. Now that's interesting. Repeat that for uh -huh. me, John. But uh, why? what message can we offer people that would have them turn to us? Uh, Adolf Hitler well, had a message, and the German people loved him. They loved well, him, and I they supported see. him. You can see that on my website, The Greatest Story Never Told. Yeah, actually, um, a friend of mine um, sent me some uh, a video he did, and it was about when Hitler entered Austria, which, of course, he was born and raised in Austria, and then Austria was joining Germany, joining the Third Reich, and uh, the Austrians have been so poor. From 1914, World War I began. All throughout the night, then the war was lost. Then the great inflation of the 1920s, the misery, and all throughout the 1930s, Austria was not part of Germany, so when Hitler was rebuilding the German economy, they weren't part of it. And they were starving. They had 18 straight years of misery and death. And you look at the pictures of these crowds as Hitler re-enters his own country of Austria. He's, he's reconnecting it to Germany. And you can see, it's very interesting. The faces are contorted with grief, but the mouth is smiling. They've been through so much. And, and women are crying. They're just tears pouring out of their eyes. Is the agony finally over? They just want to believe, will this agony be over? Will we have food? Will my husband ever have a job again? Will, will my children have more than bread and water? Will I be able to stop thinking suicidal thoughts? And the difference between now and then is this. When Hitler came to power legally and democratically by the ballot box, he played by the rules. Um, the situation in Germany was in some ways much better, though. First of all, the Germans are highly disciplined people. And when Hitler put them back to work, Germany just began carrying out miracles because that's the way the Germans are. You give the German confidence and, and order and then firm leadership and the Germans will just produce miracle after miracle, military, scientific, cultural, in every area. Germany bloomed immediately. Um, so Hitler had that advantage. Working with the German people, the German people are an amazing people. Uh, other great white nations as well, but the Germans have a proven track record of genius. Uh, the other thing was uh, the German military had no Jews in it. The, it was an unwritten law, no Jews in the officer corps. They just would not allow Jews to serve in the German military. Uh, and there were some Jews in the police force. Uh, yes, in fact, the police commissioner of Berlin who caused Hitler's people a lot of trouble was a Jew uh, named Weiss, Isidore Weiss. Uh, the media was only half Jewish controlled, though. And here in America, everything's different. Uh, Jews are all throughout our military, including admirals and generals. In fact, uh, Steve, I know you're from the Scranton, Pennsylvania area. Uh, oh. This extremely evil Jewish uh, Air Force general uh, for some Scranton. Uh, he was the one who organized that Operation Northwoods, which was a, uh, a false flag attack planned by him. Uh, what was his name now? Um, but it was rejected by President Kennedy. It was to uh, shoot down an American passenger jet full of passengers and then blame it on Castro and then the United States was then to invade Cuba and uh, Kennedy was appalled wow. uh, uh, Lyman Lemnitzer Lyman Lemnitzer was a Jew from Scranton and he was an Air Force General Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Kennedy and he said this is how we'll take out Castro we'll shoot down a plane full of Americans we we the American Air Force will shoot down a plane full of Americans we'll blame it on Castro then you'll have excuse. 
Kennedy was appalled. Kennedy was appalled. Said, Absolutely not. <laughs> but so that's Lyman Lemnitzer from Scranton. Father was a shopkeeper or something, or a rag picker wow. or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right in Scranton. Yeah. Uh, Joe Biden is from Scranton. <laughs> Congratulations, all kinds of wonderful people. <laughs> ah, the, yeah. the government of Scranton is uh, one of the dirtiest governments, <laughs> as far as like on a city level, on one of the dirtiest governments uh, <laughs> I've ever witnessed. It's disturbing um, what our our city council and you know some of the stuff that that gets done over here, but that's a whole new, that's a whole another story. I could go on with that for hours. Yeah, I, I tell you, I was really shocked when I moved back to my native Pennsylvania in, the, in 2008. On the one hand, the people of Pennsylvania are great people, beautiful small towns, nice people, uh, a lot of different white ethnic groups: Germans, Italians, Slovaks, Irish. A lot of ethnic clubs and, uh, you know, ethnic flavor, which is kind of cool, you know, as well as, you know, English and Scotch-Irish, a lot of Germans, biggest group is Germans, and a lot of Italians, though. Um, and I, I love the state, love the people. But the government was the exact opposite. I've never seen such a gap between a decent people and an extremely evil government. The state government and, uh, uh, and and masons everywhere, free masons everywhere in Pennsylvania. Yes, and I mean, you, you drive past yeah, houses the Masonic in Masonic Temple, is and big. you see a big black star on the side of the house. And somebody said to me, "That's masons." Have you noticed that in Eastern Pennsylvania also? These black stars. Um, I haven't seen any black stars. I know that uh, it's a the, the culture here is uh, heavily heavily Masonic, especially the uh, you know the, the higher ups in, in the government and the, the city council. They're all involved in that. We have a we have a pretty uh, big Masonic temple here in Scranton. It's uh, a huge old building. I mean, I can only imagine what they do over there. But yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's a big Masonic uh, culture, Freemason oriented society here in Scranton. Um, you know, it's another reason for me to not really, you know, trust the people here. Um, the people themselves, as you said, but the government here is just, it's, it's dirty. It's like that everywhere. I don't think I could really say Scranton is any different than anywhere else. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's like, what can you do? You know, <laughs> well, I just live here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's very important to take a spiritual approach. You know, uh, uh, Clay, you, you asked me, you know, what's the solution? Uh, we can't come to power legally and peacefully. I mean, let's, uh, I tried running for president in 2012. Uh, white nationalists didn't even support me. And one of them said to me, they'll never let you win, so what's the point? That's why he wouldn't send me any money. Well, I could have gotten the message out, uh, but they didn't care about that. Uh, I had a really winnable race for sheriff in 2013 in Armstrong County, a 98% white county, hates Obama, rednecks and pickup trucks, pro-gun, uh, landslided against Obama in 2008, 2012, and people didn't support me there either. Uh, and then the enemy, the FBI, took lots of action against me. So you have the government coming down on you on the one hand, and white nationalists not supporting you on the other hand. So you're really alone. You stand up against the system, and you find out you're alone on the front lines. Kind of like in trench warfare, you climb out of the Absolutely. trenches to attack the enemy, and nobody else gets out of the trench. <laughs> and all the machine guns are pointed just at you. <laughs> and that's what I found happened. And I tried running for mayor in 2014, and zero support. This is what Nash is basically, their attitude is, what are you going to do? It's defeatism. We're effed. <laughs> and... Uh, the problem, what's insane about this is, is that the Jews are one quarter of one percent of the human race. And they've done such a mind job on us that we're convinced we're doomed. In reality, they should be the ones that are doomed because we're 99.75 percent of the human race, the Gentiles. They've got us convinced we're doomed. And therefore we are. Because in our head we're doomed. Uh, it's crazy. Everybody's miserable and everybody's angry. <laughs> I don't understand my fellow American. We're miserable. We're angry. We have guns. Well, and America, you know, we have freedom of speech. The elite, <laughs> the elitists, have come out and stated that 
We simply aren't smart enough to rule ourselves. And judging from the last elections, I have to agree with them. <laughs> well, I think it lets, it, we need, at this point, we need a new, and this is my mission, to create a new spiritual movement to reawaken the soul. In Eastern religion, they talk about the chakras, the organs of the spiritual body. We have to get into the higher frequency. We have to stop fearing, most of all, fearing ridicule, dismissal, or arrest, or death, or anything like that, and realize we are children of the living God, and we will be judged, particularly as men, on what we do or fail to do. We really don't have the option. Um, and I'm, I'm reading an audio book. It's called The Words of Adolf Hitler. And he talks about how practical it is to be an idealist. I mean, society cannot survive without idealism. Idealism leads to national power. It leads to national wealth. It leads to safety, safe streets, happy children, families without divorce and misery and suicide. There's nothing more practical than idealism. And there's nothing more dangerous than selfish egotism. Everybody ends up miserable and at each other's throats. Uh, so we must say, I will lead an idealistic, self-sacrificing life. I will trod the path of heroism, like our heroic American ancestors, the American Revolution. And we can win this thing. So that's my mission. Uh, because otherwise, th the things we've talked about on this radio show, we could become so despairing, is it, I just want to go and get drunk, <laughs> or I want to step in front of a bus. You know, uh, we have to believe that we are not born to be this Zachariah Sitchin thing. Well, aliens created the human race to mine for gold. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe the human race was created by aliens to be gold mine worker slaves. No. I really reject that idea. I think it's toxic. Uh, we are children of the living God. We are rising up through each incarnation. And our mission is to drop the me and, and think about we and think about working together and loving each other and, and, and loving our children enough to ensure that America will not be a living hell. I have children. I have grandchildren. And when I think of the world my granddaughters will live in, I say, I must do something. I can't just read about it and think about it, and I can't just not think about it. We have to do something, or we're condemning them to a living hell. And I will say as a guy, uh, if you're going to put children in this world, I, then you're committing a crime, because you're putting children into hell. This is my responsibility as a father and a grandfather is to make sure that my daughters and my granddaughters do not grow up in hell. Well, I, I'm going to die I, wrote, anyway. I wrote a poem 45 years ago of how you shouldn't care. You can't go because you are there, and you stay until you pay. As I said before, you stay as men, not more. And that was in a poem I wrote called The Guest. And it's one of the reasons I have decided that in the future I'm going to finish the books I started writing 45 years ago okay. because I frankly don't believe you can handle the truth as the American people can't handle the truth. And we really do have answers, but... I'm going to put those answers in my books, and I'm going to write those books as science fiction. Very good, very good. Very good. Well, we, we, we need different approaches to awaken people uh, to what's going on. And I, I, I believe we're going to have a golden opportunity in the future, because people are going to hit the wall of absolute misery. And at that point, they're going to, they're going to want to follow and fight and obey and uh, throw themselves into the breach against the enemy because they don't want to see I'm already there. they don't want to experience this this hell yeah what's that Steve? we've had the answers oh, I said, I'm for over a hundred years we've had all of the answers nikola tesla gave us some of the answers we've had the answers the media 
and the elite and the uh, controllers don't want to you to have the answers because they can't make any money off of you if you got the answers. We're out of time here. And Tesla's been as depressed for you. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Clay. I was just saying, uh, Nikola Tesla's uh, technology has been suppressed for years. I'm sure our government has much technology that was developed by Tesla that we don't see. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, we could live in a happy, wonderful, pollution-free, uh, safe planet. Uh, America could be a America and the world could be a paradise, and that's what we have to work for that dream. That's well, right. Thanks for having me on, Clay. I appreciate that. Appreciate you being on, and we'll do this again. We're out of time. God bless you all. Thanks for Thank uh, you, listening. Freeamerican.com. Shop.freeamerican.com. And we got all the links to this show. Share it. Got links for John Denugent there. And uh, if you're a biker, uh, I wouldn't be riding around Texas today. God bless you all. Thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. My Thank pleasure. You, Steve. Welcome. You're welcome back it. anytime. Thank you all. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. God bless.